Welcome Concrete Maniacs, I'm Tyler Lay, and I'm going to talk to you about testing cement. This is part one of a two-part series. Of all the materials in concrete, cement is by far the most tested ingredient, by far, most evaluated. Portland cement is tested for chemical composition, fineness, set time, heat hydration, strength gain, and in this part, first part one, I'll be talking about chemical composition, fineness, and uh, that's it. In part two, we'll be talking about set time, heat of hydration, and strength gain. This information is supplied on a single piece of paper, something called a mill certification or a mill cert. It's an average over the last 30 days. So be careful. The material that you get that day may be a little bit different than what the mill certification says. And also remember that they blend different materials to try to help produce an average quality material out of a certain plant, okay? So just because a clinker is made one day, it may be blended with another clinker to try to provide a uniformity to a product. And that's a good thing, ladies and gentlemen. That's, that's a very good thing. Uniformity in our materials is exactly what we want. Chemical composition. Let's get started with that first. It is common, very, very common. The most common used technique to evaluate the chemical composition of cement is something called X-ray fluorescence. This is when you actually bombard an atom with lots of X-rays and they'll fluoresce certain characteristic X-rays based on their elemental composition. Yeah, I know. This is called the photoelectric effect. I know. And, and Einstein actually developed it. He won a Nobel Prize for it. Good for you, Einstein. Anyway, we use this for our cements. And it tells you the oxides. It tells you kind of like the chemical building blocks that can be used to build certain compounds. So when we talk about something like calcium oxide, that's the type of thing, or Al2O3. That's the type of information, the percentage of that is the type of information that comes out of this analysis. Now, it does not tell you how those are put together. And I like to use this analogy. I like to talk about the oxides are kind of like building blocks for other materials. It's kind of like a car is made up of nuts and bolts and pieces of metal and plastic and all kinds of other things. And I could give you a list of everything that's inside of a car. It's this many nuts, it's this many bolts, it's this many, etc. Does it always mean we're going to build a car with it? No. We could build lots of stuff with it. But it tells you what's in that car. And comparing the amount of nuts and bolts and metal from one car to another car, that could be useful. Well, at least it's useful in the chemical composition world. At least it's useful with cements. So we use these oxide information to actually predict what compounds. What are the compounds again? The compounds are C3S, C2S, C3A, C4AF, and then our friend limestone. We're trying to predict these. There's a big equation to do it by this great guy named Bogue. He's an old guy. He's dead. But thank you, thank you, Bogue, for coming up with the equation because we've used your equation to death. We use it all the time, every single day. It basically takes all these different oxides and it calculates or estimates based off a bunch of thermodynamic equations how much C3S, C2S, C3A, and C4AF is supposed to be inside the cement. And you can get these equations by looking up ASTM C150 for more details. And they're based on lots of assumptions and they're not always right, but do we need to be perfect or do we need to be close? And most of the time in engineering, being close is good enough. There's also not a great way to correct these equations for limestone. Limestone has been something that's been added relatively recently. Okay. And, and so tweaking this is a little bit difficult, and people are still working on the final ways to do that. On average, though, the C3S content is usually underestimated, and the C2S content is typically overestimated with this Bogue equation, but it just depends.
One way to improve on x-ray fluorescence is to use a different technique. The better technique is called x-ray diffraction. X-ray diffraction actually measures the spacing of the atoms inside of a certain material. So it truly measures how those atoms are put together. So it can tell you the phases. It can tell you the typical, it can measure directly how much C3S, C2S, C3, and C4F, or at least that's the idea. This technique makes much more accurate measurements, but there's still problems. Um, there's some overlap between some of the, um, the, the, the peaks, some of the analysis. There's a little bit of noise in some of the data. But the good news is there is now an ASTM. There's now a standard procedure over this ASTM C1365. And it only took like, I don't know, 10 or 15 years to actually make happen. So congratulations to them. But there's now a standard way to evaluate this and use this. And there's a lot of people for a long time that have said the results were dependent on a lot of different stuff, but they've decided on something. So another useful trick that people use to sometimes get some kind of in, insight in, into the composition is look at the weight change from cooking it. Typically, the, the simplest test is called the loss on ignition test or the LOI test, and it's described by ASTM C114. And you basically, you heat up the cement to about 105 degrees C just to get any water out of it that happens to be there. And then you take the weight. And then you heat it up to about 1,000 degrees C. And you weigh it again. And the change in weight divided by the initial sample weight is the loss on ignition in percent. The loss of material on ignition. That's what the information is supposed to give you. It basically, it's an indication of how much prehydration has occurred. Because remember, when we make cement, we've already gone way above 1,000 C, way above 1,000 C. So anything that, that is around, anything that may be hydrated, it will actually combust. It will burn up and it won't be there anymore. So this test tells you kind of how prehydrated the cement is. So if you're in a very, very moist environment, or if you have an old bag of cement or an old container and you're worried about it, an LOI test is a great way to evaluate this, to evaluate is it right or is it not? Is it prehydrated or not? However, now that people have started to add limestone, the limestone is going to combust as well. Remember, the limestone is not with the clinker. The limestone is ground afterwards with the gypsum and the clinker. Okay, so when you heat up the limestone, you're actually calcining it. You're actually burning off the CO2. And so to address this, they've started taking weights of samples at 600 degrees Celsius. And they attribute part of the weight loss between 600 C and 1000 C is from the CO2. But this is still being worked on right now. But again, LOI is another way people try to look at composition of our cements. The last property I'm going to talk about today in this video is the fineness. What is that? The fineness is a measurement of the particle size distribution of the cement. This is important because particles of different sizes change lots of different properties of concrete. It changes the workability or the flowability. It changes the reactivity as in the strength gain. And also it changes the heat given off. All of these things are attributed to particle size distribution. So it's good to get it right. Or does it have to be right? Or does it just need to be consistent? Consistent. The most common technique to measure particle size distribution in cement is something where we use air permeability. Or people call it Blaine after the gentleman that made it or the gentleman that oversaw the thousands and thousands of experiments that were needed to establish it. And I'll talk about those in a second. And it's described in ASTM C204. So what you basically do is you take a cup of a standard volume. Okay, so I'm drawing a cup there. And you pack it full of cement in a very, very consistent manner. Okay, so you got, you got your cup full of uh, particles there that are packed in a very consistent manner. 
Very, very, very consistent volume. And then basically you force air through it. You push air through the particles. And if you have a particle, I'm going to zoom in now. I'm going to zoom in here. And if you have, we zoomed in, if we have mainly large particles, then it's pretty easy for that air to get around them, right? It's pretty easy for that air to move around them. But if I zoomed in and I made up of bunches of small particles, a whole bunch of small particles, then it's much harder for that air to get through. It's going to be much more work, much more serpentine. That's like a snake shape, right? It's much harder for the air to pass through the, uh, the powder. So that's an indication of the surface area. So a coarse powder is going to be easier for air to flow. A finer powder is going to be harder for the air to flow. And basically, they compare this pressure response to powders of known surface areas. You should see the thousands and thousands of powders that they did to compare this pressure change meant this surface area. This pressure change meant this surface area. And there's still a little bit of hand waving there, but it's a pretty useful tool. It's pretty cool that you can just measure how fast the air goes through something, a packed bed of it, and that tells you about particle size distribution. And they express this in terms of meters squared per kilogram. And so be a little wary of these units. They're not exactly perfect. They're not. They're an estimate. Another quick way to get this type of information, and another useful technique that a lot of folks use is where they wet sieve cement. They actually take cement and they force it through a sieve, a very, very small sieve, uh, um, a number 325, or it's got about a 45 micron um, opening size. And they, they do it with not with water. They actually mix it with others, other liquids that won't react with the cement, like acetone or isopropanol. And they, they try to see what's caught. And they, they think that about 95% of the particles should go through. Only about 5% should be caught on the sieve. And again, that's an indication of how large the particles are. You can also use something called a laser particle analyzer that'll actually go through and it tries to send particles through a tube. It actually suspends them in, in, um, in a fluid, tries to send them through a tube and tries to use the laser to measure the size. There's some, there's some problems with it though. Um, it's better than we've had before and it definitely has problems detecting small particles or particles that actually clump together. Um, but it is useful to compare different processes, and people are working to refine it every single day. Take care.